I'm hesitant to use the term crisis to describe the plight of black and I would add Latino males because uh, in many cities across the country, uh, the data for Latino males is as bad as it is for black males. I'm hesitant to use the term crisis because if it was a crisis, we would see an urgent response. When you have a crisis, you expect to see extraordinary measures taken to do something about the problem. We stop what we're doing, we focus resources, we take action. Uh, this is not a new crisis. Many of us know this has been around for a very long time. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm an expert on it is simply because I've been studying this and working on this for a very long time. And any problem that's around for a very long time is no longer a crisis. If you meet someone who's in permanent crisis, you've got to stop saying that person's in crisis. Right? That's their condition. It's a chronically debilitating condition in our communities, the status of black males. And the fact that there isn't an urgent response tells you a lot about the nature of the problem at hand. Because to a large degree, America doesn't see this as an American problem, it sees this as a black problem or a Latin problem. Now the fact that we have a diverse crowd shows you that it's not merely people in the black or Latino communities who recognize this as a huge problem, but we've got to face facts that if we don't have policymakers who are willing to not just come out when there's a killing caught on film, but who are willing to sustain their attention on this issue, and not just policymakers, but business leaders who are willing to also take action, then not much is going to change. We can celebrate the successes of urban prep, and we should, but we have to keep in mind the big picture. The big picture is even as we celebrate urban prep, we know that dropout rates for black males across the country in every major large urban district are over 50 percent. And we know that suspension and expulsion rates are higher for black and Latino males than for any other group, that so are special ed placements, the test scores are lower. That is, in every category we associate with success academically for black males especially, black males are underrepresented. And in every category we associate with success, they're overrepresented. <laughs> it's a dire situation. It's a dire situation because we know that what happens in school mirrors what happens in adulthood. That is, those we don't serve well in school, those who are more likely to drop out and not go to college are also less likely to be employed, more likely to be incarcerated, and more likely to die young. We have a serious problem on our hands. Black males in this country are the only segment of the society, of the U.S. population, that has a declining life expectancy. Every other group is living longer, black males living shorter. Black males actually save the country money when it comes to Social Security because don't live long enough on average to collect Social Security. So the problems that we're talking about facing young men are also problems that face older men. And what's important that we acknowledge is that we don't have clarity on why. Because the problems are not merely in education. They show up in employment. They show up in criminal justice. They show up in health. They show up in a broad array of statistics that look more like a syndrome than a particular crisis that you could put your hands on and say, well, if we just did more of this, we could solve it. Simplistic thinking is not going to help us figure out how to approach it. We don't know what there is about being black and male in America that results in large numbers of black males being at risk. There's a lot of confusion out there. There are some who think, well, the problem is really black men themselves. And there are lots of people who we have respected who think this. I was in a debate not long ago with Bill Cosby. He's one of them. 
And he has said repeatedly, he thinks the problem is black family. The problem is that black males don't pull their pants up, black, that they, they, they uh, idolize thug life, thug culture. Juan Williams, noted black journalist, said pretty much the same thing. Alvin Poussant, a well-respected black psychologist, co-wrote a book with Bill Cosby, saying effectively the same thing, that something is wrong. There are these self-destructive tendencies among black men that are contributing to this problem. If you locate the problem there, you're going to pursue one course of action. You're going to do like Bill Cosby and just continue to admonish, blame parents, perhaps, but there's not a whole lot more you can do because if black males are destroying themselves, then the rest of us can basically say, well, they need to stop. Everybody else is off the hook. Now, there's obviously some element of truth there. There's a reason why black males are more likely to be murdered than any other group in this country, and it's not the Klan that's killing black males. It's other black males. And so to some degree, there are self-destructive tendencies that we've got to get a handle on. When you see the video of the young black man who was murdered in front of his school, who was there shooting? Who's involved in this melee? It's other black males. So there is something going on, and that's another part we don't know. We don't understand what masculinity has to do with it. And that, I would say, is a critical issue because if you look at it in terms of masculinity and not just in terms of race, what you start to realize is that we have a problem with men that cuts across race. Because right now in every state in the country, there are more women than men in college. That's not just true for black men, it's true for white men. True for Latinos, true with everybody except for Asians. So maybe there's something about men that's a problem. If there's something about masculinity that's at stake here, then maybe with the way we raise boys, the way we socialize boys might also be implicated in this. And that's the reason why I say there's a lot of confusion out there. Because some people say, well, what boys need to do is man up. tough enough. And I would say that part of the problem is that we expect too many boys to become men way too soon without any clarity of what it means to be a man today. It's interesting because we had a women's movement in this country. We still have some degree of women's movement. Had a major impact on the way women are treated in this country and the way women see themselves. Not to say that that movement is at all over, but the simple fact is if you ask most girls in this country, what do you want to be when you grow up? You rarely hear secretary or nurse or even teacher anymore. Because girls think they could be almost anything they want now, even president. That's because the women's movement was very clear that part of what limits women are gender roles. And what we have to fight against are the narrowness of those gender roles that limit the sense of what girls can become. There's been no corresponding movement amongst men about the ways in which masculinity might limit and too tightly define and constrain our sense of who we can be as human beings. Consider for a moment that patriarchy as a cultural system is still very much intact in this country, for sure, isn't it? Men run things for the most part. Run the economy. It was an interesting article, came out a few weeks ago. What, happened, what would happen if women ran Wall Street? Maybe less risk taking. Maybe less high stakes profiter, profiteering. Men pretty much run politics still, don't they? Or I guess I should say we. We run lots of things. Doesn't mean we run them well, but we are in charge. So if patriarchy is still pretty much intact as a cultural system, how could it be that men are in crisis? 
What's the nature of this crisis? How could it be a man's world and men are in trouble? Maybe the world that men have created is one that places men at risk. One of the things that we don't ask nearly enough is why is it that girls are outperforming boys in school? And I don't want to go too far with that because there are lots of girls who are also in trouble, lots of girls who are not successful. Teen pregnancy is still a major problem in many of our communities. So this is not about comparing who's worse off. But consistently, and particularly when you look at the historically black colleges, you'll see 50, sometimes 75% of the undergraduates are women. To some degree, it seems clear that young women know how to do school better than boys. What's that about? I think there's a lot about culture that we have to interrogate. And when I talk about culture, I mean both black culture, but I also mean American culture. I mean youth culture. I mean hip hop culture. I mean all the different facets and aspects of culture because what we're not so good at explaining either is why it is that sometimes even in the same family you have one who goes to college and one goes to prison. Theoretically the same home environment, the same influences and very different trajectories. How do we explain that? Michael Eric Dyson, some of you know him, good friend. He's got a brother doing life in prison right now. That's an all too common, though perhaps extreme in his case, but it's a common experience by many African Americans in this country. And that forces us to recognize that we're not just talking about culture. We also have to focus on the structure of American society, on the way racism is still deeply implicated in all of its institutions. We know for a long time, especially you should know this in Chicago because William Julius Wilson did his work here in Chicago about the changing nature of the American political economy and what happened when work disappeared from industrial centers across America, particularly in places like Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and Buffalo. A black labor force that, was, that migrated from the South that came to these cities to do industrial labor became obsolete when industrial labor no longer needed, was no longer needed for American industry. We know right now during the middle of this recession that black unemployment rates are two and sometimes three times as high as white unemployment rates. And for black youth beneath the age of 25, they are five times as high. Unemployment has an impact on all of this. It impacts families. It impacts stability, sense of security that children have while they're in school. If we only focus on culture and we ignore the ways in which this society has rendered certain people obsolete and marginal, We'll end up doing like Bill Cosby, pointing a finger at people, and meanwhile, the people who control the economy, who are still giving themselves bonuses, will act like this is not our issue, not our problem. And they may give some nice donations so we can have a meeting about it, but do nothing to actually address the systemic roots of it. Even during the height of American prosperity in New York City, there was a 50% black male unemployment rate when the economy was booming, 50%. What happens now when we're in deep recession? We have to look at the structure of our economy. We have to look at the way our institutions function, criminal justice system, and our school system. And when we look at these institutions, what we have to do is not just focus on who's in charge, but the lens through which they look at our children. Because sometimes the people who have that lens are us. I was visiting an elementary school in Berkeley, California, being given a tour by an African-American assistant principal who was very proud of his school, showing me his library, showing me his new computer lab, and then we get to his office. And there's a little boy about eight years old outside of his office waiting to see him. 
And he turns to him and he says, you see that little boy? He said, there's a prison cell in San Quentin waiting for that little boy right now. So I turned to him and asked him, I said, how do you know that? He said, well, his father's in prison. His brother's in prison. And I can tell by the way he behaves. He's such a hell raiser that that's just where he's going. And then I asked him, well, given what you know about this little boy, what is the school doing to keep him out of prison? And he turns to me with a puzzled look because he doesn't think that's his job. In fact, what he was about to do was to put this little boy on long-term suspension and send him home to be taken care of by his sick grandmother where they'd send the work to him and claim credit for attendance but in effect, wash their hands. We have too many institutions that deliberately treat young men as though they were unimportant and could easily be discarded. And I would say that if we are not aware of the ways in which these institutions operate, and sometimes the way we ourselves contribute to these patterns, nothing will change. Nothing will change because it is now so firmly implicated in the operation of our society that we have become accustomed to the idea that black men will be marginal, that black men will be overrepresented in our nation's prisons. We have over two million people in prison. Have you heard a single politician say there's too many people in prison? This is too much now? Actually, Jim Webb was saying it for a little while. I guess he's run for re-election, so he'd stop talking about that now, Jim Webb and Virginia. That isn't actually a winning issue. Why? Because fear. Fear is so powerful that Americans will lock people up in droves. We have more people incarcerated than any nation in the history of the world right now. And it's not even a policy issue we're debating. Even though everybody knows every dollar we spend to incarcerate is a dollar we don't have for health care, don't have for education, don't have for any other social need. But that's one part of the budget, one part of policy we're not willing to touch. And who do we incarcerate? We incarcerate the uneducated, the unemployed, the illiterate, the mentally ill. That's who we incarcerate in America. But it's not an issue that we debate and we incarcerate lots and lots of black and Latino men. So we have to be careful, even as we focus on solutions, that we not underestimate what we're up against. I'm going to a lot of events like these now. People are saying, let's talk about what's going on, and I'm, I'm happy that we're talking about it. But I'm also worried about it. Because I know that there's a lot of folks out there who confuse talking about something with actually doing something about it. You ever, you ever do that? I used to have a lot of friends. We would talk about basketball. I said, let's go play. No, let's keep talking about it. <laughs> you see that with the kids now. They're more content to play video game basketball than to actually get sweaty out on the court. We have to get sweaty with this one. We actually have to do something about this one. Meetings like this are only meaningful if we come out of here with an action plan and say, okay, these are what we're going to do. If urban prep works, how many more are we going to create in Chicago? How many more? And what are we going to do about the schools that are the dropout factories right here in Chicago? It's ironic because you guys gave us Arnie Duncan. <laughs> Chicago gave us Arnie Duncan, and Arnie Duncan said he wants to shut down dropout factories. Sounds tough, doesn't it? So if I told them, I said, look, Arnie, you know, if you want to shut down dropout factories, you're going to have to shut down a whole lot of places. You have to shut down just about all of Detroit, all of Baltimore. You have to shut down St. Louis, too, and a good part of Chicago. You know what? I don't think we expect Arnie Duncan to simply shut schools down. I expect, we expect him to actually fix schools up. Leadership is not simply about calling attention to the problem, it's also about helping us develop solutions. We need problem solvers now. I was reading the report on Urban Prep, and when it gets available, or Tim gets to read it first, okay? <laughs> and it is a glowing report, but there's also information about how the school can improve, and we have to be careful. Let's not set Urban Prep up. They have room to grow. 
these young men are going to college, but we want them to graduate from college too now, right? That's the next step. And we want to make sure the next class comes even better prepared than this class. I told Jeff Canada the same thing. Everybody loves Jeff Canada, Harlem Children's Zone. I said, Jeff, be careful. Because they'll praise you one moment, and then as soon as they see the ways in which the hype was not real, they will then say, oh, another wasted effort. I was on a panel with Jeff Canada and Arnie Duncan a few weeks before the election. And I asked Jeff Canada, those of you who don't know Jeff Canada, Jeff Canada started the Harlem Children's Zone. It's getting a lot of attention because it's probably the most ambitious anti-poverty program in the United States right now in Harlem. And I asked Jeff, I said, Jeff, is there any evidence that providing the kind of services, because they provide music, they provide after-school programs, they provide a full range of services to parents and children, is there any evidence that it's actually impacting test scores and, and academic outcomes? And he said, I object to the question. I said, why? He said, when middle class kids get violin lessons, nobody asks them, does it boost their test scores? They get, they get the violin lessons anyway. They get gymnastics, they get everything. No one says, let's see the evidence. We only ask that question with poor kids. He's right. But guess what? They're asking for the evidence. And those of us who are doing the work, who are the advocates, who are studying these issues, we need to show there's actual evidence that what we're doing works that what we're doing works. So National US University needs to work with the schools in this area to figure out, okay, what works? How can we do more of what works? Very important study came out here on Chicago just a few months ago on the school reforms. It's called Organizing for School Improvement. It's done by Anthony Bright from Carnegie Foundation and John Easton, who now heads the Office of Organizational Research for Arne Duncan. It's an analysis of 10 years of school reform in Chicago. It's a very important study because it wants to look, ask the question, why did some schools get better and some schools did it? And you know what they find in the schools that didn't get better? They the schools that served the truly disadvantaged. That's the term that William Julius Wilson used, the most Marginal, the kids in the projects, the project that they've been tearing down here in Chicago. Those kids in those schools made the least improvement. That's where we've got to focus our energy. Not at the expense of anyone else, but we've got to make sure that those kids who are experiencing the, con the intersection of not only racial injustice, but poverty, get the opportunities they deserve because it is that combination that's so lethal. Because we consistently give those who need the most the very least in our schools and everywhere else. And we have a debate going around the country right now in education of whether or not we can ignore poverty. Can you actually believe that that's a debate? Chancellor Joel Klein in New York City, he's leading the debate. Had an article last week said the issue is not poverty. The issue is teaching. That's why we have to judge teachers by test scores, to drive out the bad teachers. I'm willing to drive out bad teachers, but I'm not willing to ignore poverty. Same week that he came out with this study that's saying it was all about teachers, not about poverty, we had a study that showed that academic performance for kids whose parents lose their jobs goes down between 15 and 20 percent in the first year. The kids with chronic asthma miss between 30 and 40 days of school a year. Who suffers from poverty, from asthma the most? Poor children. We have to have a sophisticated analysis. We have to be able to look at the way in which poverty interacts with racial isolation in our most isolated communities to produce behaviors that may in fact be self-destructive. That is, we can't ignore the fact that culture might be part of this, but we also can't ignore the ways in which the political economy is also part of it. I was asked to go to Rikers Island. Rikers Island is the largest penal institution in the world. It's that prison right out there by LaGuardia Airport. A lot of people 
don't even know it's there. I was asked to say something to 600 young people that would be inspiring. And I'm thinking for weeks ahead of time, what could I possibly say that would be inspiring to these young men who are incarcerated? So I get there, and you know when you go to visit a prison, you have to go through lots of locks and lots of security and get searched multiple times. And finally, I get into a big auditorium like this, guards all around, young men in their orange jumpsuits, not looking too happy to hear a lecture from a professor from NYU. And I turn to them, I say, you know what? There's a conspiracy to keep you here. It's a conspiracy because this country makes money off of your incarceration. The guards that are here today need you to keep coming back because they get paid based upon your presence. The guards start looking around like, who brought this guy? Why is he here? So there are whole towns upstate New York that depend on their prisons to keep their economies going, and they're lobbying to keep their prisons because they need you. And then I said to them, my question to you is this, are you part of the conspiracy too? Because the whole system doesn't work unless you continue to make bad decisions, unless you continue to allow them to lock you up. And the data shows you'll be back in two years, because two-thirds of them will be back in two years, because we're not in the business of rehabilitating. We're in the business of holding tanks and keeping people locked up. And I got a lively debate going, and so lively that after about two hours, they said, you've got to stop now. They're getting a little out of hand. And I thought, well, I succeeded. And as they were filing out, one of the teachers said to me, she said, talk to this young man. She said, he's really good in math. Talk to him. And I went to shake his hand, and he went like this. He said, look, I'm a crip for life, and walked out. And I knew then it takes more than one visit to Rikers and engage in a provocative discussion to change attitudes and beliefs that have been shaped over many years. There's no easy solution to this. Let us not pretend that if we just created one more mentoring program, we're going to solve this thing. Let us look at what's happened at Urban Prep and ask ourselves, how do we create more schools than these? When I come back later, I'll talk about some of the things we've learned from the research, because it's very revealing what we've learned. And it's not that there's magic in isolating boys. Prisons isolate boys, too. The magic is in the relationships. The magic is in the expectations. The magic is instilling the belief of what's possible in these young men. We need to do that in a lot more places. And we need to do that in a lot more settings outside of school as well, because the fact is that schools can't always do this alone. So I'm glad you're here. I hope I, I, I provoked some thought today. <laughs> and I hope that, um, at the minimum, uh, prevent anyone from leaving here thinking that this is going to be easy. It's not easy. We're faced with a serious, serious problem on our hands. It's an American problem. An American problem. Thank you.